Okay. So we're going to get to some of the stuff that I didn't get to last time. Uh, we'll talk about logistics very briefly just because I have some announcements. Um, I did add a Google form for adding your own participation for the class. So previously, in previous years, we'd have, you know, you sort of just track your Piazza participation over time and then at the very end of the year, pop it into a spreadsheet and then we would count it. But I recognize a lot of you probably are posting anonymously and you don't want to go back, you know, in 10 weeks and search for your name or whatever and try to find your previous posts. So just use this Google form for submitting them as you do them. It'll save everybody time. You can also use it for the in-class participation. Um, it'll just give you a yes, you know, a box to say, I want to do this for in-class or I want to do this for Piazza and then just fill it out. Also, I did get the EEG equipment ordered for the hands-on labs, so those should happen. And ETS told me that Jupyter Hub should be ready soon, hopefully by Friday, which is when I'm planning on releasing the first homework assignment. Um, and if not, I'll delay it. It's fine. No big deal. There is an unofficial Discord created, and I wanted to bring it up because I personally really like Discord, but I hate administering Discord as like an admin for a class. Um, and I especially don't like getting DM'd by students. So I, I, I have DM'd some of you in the past with other information. You can talk to me about the other stuff that we've talked about, but please, please, please do not DM me about class information. Just email me um, or send me a message through Canvas. And also don't bother the TAs if they join up. But Discord is great. Just know that you're not going to get any credit for participating on Discord. So for the real questions that you want credit for, ask them on Piazza. Um, also, I have uh, set up my office hours locations. I know Shrini and Ina are also using this room, and I think Q will be as well. Um, anyway, this is where we are right now. This is where HSS is. It's at the very bottom. It's kind of maze-like if you haven't been there. It's in the old design lab, if, if anyone has taken a design class. It's a cool space. That's where we'll end up having the labs as well. So that's where we're having office hours. We have that room to ourselves. No other class is using it, which is awesome. So we're going to try to use it as frequently as possible. All right. So uh, today I'm mostly going to be talking about neuroimaging modalities and how they relate to brain-computer interfaces. The Oh, I just realized I haven't shared the screen for Zoom, which is the perfect time for me to remember that. Um, so yes, quick intro to neuroimaging modalities. As you can see, there's kind of a lot of different ones. And, Honestly, this isn't even all of them. So the main thing to keep in mind is this general trend of the y-axis being size, which is essentially the spatial resolution, is what we call it, and the x-axis being time or the temporal resolution. And you can see it's in a logarithmic scale. And the best case scenario, right, if you had some magical modality, you'd be right here in this lower left-hand corner. You'd have perfect temporal precision recording at the speed of light. And you'd be recording from every synapse, or maybe even every Planck length of every synapse, right? We'd have just perfect spatial, perfect temporal resolution. Um, for various reasons, that is not currently possible, and it might never be possible. So we have to make trade-offs, typically. We have to trade off spatial resolution for temporal resolution, or vice versa. So some modalities have really, really good spatial resolution, such as electron microscopy or calcium imaging. Uh, so, you know, these can get almost to that sub-synapse level, but they're also a lot slower. You know, they rely on taking multiple samples in order to get a clear image. There's, it's similar to deep space photography, right, where you have to stare at something for a really long time in order to get a clear image. Um, and then on the other end, for a really good temporal resolution, we have patch clamps, which are essentially going directly into individual neurons or synapses, uh, well, the dendrites and the axons. But uh, what this class is going to be focused on is way up here in the top left, EEG. So EEG is really, really fast. You can record, theoretically, if you had a digitizer that was fast enough, you could record at the speed of light, right? All we're doing is we're picking up electrical activity. It's going to be propagated through wires slightly slower than the speed of light. But there's no real limit to how quickly we can sample that information. There's a lot of redundancy, but we'll talk about that later. As you can see, though, it has pretty much the worst spatial distribution possible. Um, and the reason for this is 
kind of obvious, right? When we're recording EEG, we're putting electrodes on the top of the head, but you know, the brain is way below the, you know, the hair, the skin, the skull, the protective layers of the brain, cerebral spinal fluid. I mean, it's way down there. So the fact that we're able to get anything at all is pretty impressive, but it makes sense why it's not particularly good. I am going to save most of the discussion about EEG to another time because I could talk about it forever. So we're going to talk about some of the other modalities. These are five, one, two, three, four, five, six of the most popular <laughs> systems that people use, not necessarily for BCIs, but just for neuroimaging. And they can broadly be broken up into being invasive or non-invasive. And in this case, invasive essentially means you require a surgery in order to collect that data. So for both ECOG and MEA, you actually have to you know, cut open the skull, put something on someone's brain or in somebody's brain. And for the other ones, EEG, FNIRS, MEG, and fMRI, you don't need to do that. You can just get a person who is otherwise totally healthy. They don't have to do an elective neurosurgery. You just start recording things. There's trade-offs like the temporal and spatial resolution, right? Some things you can get you can only get by doing an invasive surgery. For example, if you want to do some deep spine stimulation or something, it's going to be kind of hard to, to do that without putting something into the spine. Um, but if you want something that anybody could use and something that anybody could take off at any time, then you need something that's non-invasive. So I'm going to go down this list in reverse order for some reason. And I'll also bring up a couple of interesting sub things. There's a, a tiny region called minimally invasive. And these technologies are very new, uh, but they're also very exciting. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about them. So first, MEAs, which are microelectrode arrays. There are various different types, but one of the most common is the Utah array. So this configuration of this grid style array of needles is known as the Utah array. They're really, really tiny, as you can see. So it looks very impressive when you're zoomed in. But they're pretty small. And because of their size, they're able to relatively accurately stay in a certain location. So if you're really interested in recording from the motor cortex at a very specific point, you can just pop it in there. And hopefully, you're recording the signals that you want. Of course, there's not only going to be the activity of the, elect of the neurons that you're directly on top of or inside of, but there's also going to be the activity of all of these surrounding electrodes. And we call that the local field potential. So, or not electrodes, sorry, neurons. And we call it the local field potential, the LFP. That's going to be a problem with any invasive technology. You have to have some technique for canceling that out, because if you're only interested in a very specific region, then you might not care what the rest of the brain is doing. On the other hand, there are some people who really care about what that background signal is, the LFP. So it's not necessarily just noise. It's just a different signal. Um, these are sort of the state of the art for the invasive BCIs. And some of you might have heard of BrainGate or seen this video. I am actually going to play this whole video out. Later in the quarter, one of my friends, uh, Daryl Brown, just started his postdoc working with BrainGate. So hopefully he'll be able to talk to us about you know, the more in detail stuff with the study. But I'm going to play this video out. Oh, for people on Zoom and podcasters in the future, uh, the frame rate is super low on these. I'm sorry. There's the links here if you want to you know, watch them later. Let me play that. Play for me, YouTube. I knew it was going to be too loud. You're watching the most advanced brain-machine interface in action. Kathy Hutchinson is paralyzed and unable to speak, but just by thinking she's able to control the movements of this robotic arm and drink her morning coffee. She's part of a pioneering study run by researchers at Brown University in the US. People who are paralyzed have their brain disconnected from their body, so they're not able to go out and do everyday things that you and I can do, like reach for a glass of water or scratch your nose. And I think many of us don't realize how debilitating it is, especially for people who have the severest forms of paralysis uh, that's called tetraplegia, where they can't move their arms and legs because there's been damage to the spinal cord or a stroke that's cut the pathway from the brain to the spinal cord. So 
our idea is to bypass that damaged nervous system and go directly from the brain to the outside world so the brain signals can not control muscles but control machines or devices like a computer or a robotic limb. The trial is called BrainGate. The team announced their first success in 2006. Matt Nagel was left paralyzed in all four limbs after he was stabbed, but using the BrainGate system, he could control a cursor on a computer screen with his thoughts. I'm going to open the first email which says congrats. It says you are doing a great job. Next, I'm going to open the second email which states hi there. It says hi, we'll talk soon. Now I'm going to the exit. Next, I'm going to paint a circle. This kind of brain machine system has been tested before in monkeys. The brain gate studies show that it works in humans too. So how exactly does it work? There are three main components to any brain machine interface or brain computer interface. Uh, there's a sensor, there's a decoder, and there's a assistive technology. The sensor is a tiny array of electrodes connected to a bundle of gold wires. It's implanted in the patient's motor cortex, the part of the brain that commands body movements. The brain activity recorded by the sensor is relayed to a computer, the decoder, and that then instructs the assistive technology. A cursor is one thing, but an arm is quite another. There's really a big challenge in moving from moving a cursor on a screen, which sort of slides around in just one, two dimensions really on a flat surface, to controlling something as sophisticated as a robotic arm that has a hand and an elbow and a shoulder and can virtually move around anywhere. To design the arm, the BrainGate team worked with robotics experts in the US and Germany. One big challenge, because no one wants a clumsy robot, was to make it react to its environment. So when it collides with a target, the bottle, it grabs it. But when there's an unexpected collision, it stops moving and enters safety mode. Eventually, the researchers hope to build an arm that works as smoothly as a real one and can cope with more complicated tasks like brushing teeth. They'd also like to make a wireless version so the device doesn't need to be plugged directly into the patient's head. But for now, they're celebrating their progress with Kathy. All of us were standing in, in awe, more or less, because we were watching her drinking the coffee and, and it was really such a stunning scene. That was a special moment for all of us. It was, it was a magic moment. <laughs> in the nearly 15 years before, uh, before that event, uh, every time she wanted to take a drink of something, a uh, caregiver would need to place the cup or the bottle into a, into a holder that would be placed near her wheelchair, uh, position that bottle just right. Uh, to see her with that robotic arm reach out and pick up that cup of coffee and serve herself that coffee for the first time in, in nearly 15 years, uh, it, was, it was an incredible moment. So yeah, I, I talked last uh, lecture about how good it feels to control a BCI. Imagine how good that would have felt to be, you know, fully paralyzed, can hardly speak and be able to control a robotic arm like that, or even for the researchers to finally get a system like that working. I mean, it'd be unbelievable. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is sort of where the state of the art in the invasive control scheme is. It's not as magical as, you know, being able to perfectly rotate a hand that's attached to your body, but it's not far-fetched to believe that something like that could happen from this technology within the next, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, on one of those fronts, when they said wireless transmission, that's something that people have already been working on. So using batteries that are implanted somewhere else into the body that can be wirelessly charged and communicating with different radio frequencies, Wi-Fi, things like that, in order to directly control some sort of external application. So that, that is all progress that is being made in this field. Um, and I will make a slight correction to the, uh, the nature narrator who said that you're sort of using your thoughts to control these things. It's a little more complicated than that. So with these, it is true that you are controlling these with your, your brain, but it's not just arbitrary thoughts, right? It's not just, I am, uh, for example, the, the guy who is controlling the, the cursor on the screen, he's not just saying, okay, I want to click the email button. He's really 
imagining, he's doing something called motor imagery, where he's imagining actually moving a limb or a set of limbs in order to get that cursor into a certain position. Um, with, with Kathy here, with the robot arm, it's a little more of a direct one-to-one -one mapping, since you can think about, you know, moving this arm in the different axes, and that representation is, hopefully it's mapped one-to-one -to -one in order to make it as intuitive as possible. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, those are MEAs. And this is just a quick look at what some of those signals that it's picking up are. So if you have, um, if you, you're typically going to put these in a location that you're really interested in, typically the motor cortex or the somatosensory motor cortex. And the goal is to pick up a movement that is very reliable. You know, you're looking for these patterns that are very reliable to one set of triggers. So if you have it in the motor cortex near where the hands and fingers section is, which I'll show you a picture of, you're going to want to see what patterns are most matching each individual movement. So you'd have the participant think about moving, you know, their right index finger a hundred times and you'd record that data and then you'd have them do it for the middle one and the ring one and you'd build this pattern, this database that you could use to accurately classify which movement the participant is thinking of. Um, this doesn't only work for movement, let me be clear, but it's a very good target because if you're making a prosthetic, that's typically what you're trying to emulate. And also, all of this section of the brain, not all of it, but most of it is right on the surface. It's on the cortex. So it's pretty easy to target as well. You don't have to go way deep into the brain and risk extra damage. Um, another popular invasive method is ECOGS, electrocorticography. And this is also called IEEG because it's pretty similar to EEG, except it's invasive. Uh, it's intracranial within, within the cranium. So for this, you do have to actually remove part of the skull. It is an invasive surgery. And you place a grid of electrodes. It doesn't strictly have to be a square grid, right? You can make it an arbitrary shape in, in theory. Um, and you place that directly onto the cortex. And here's some images of that. And you record the activity essentially as close to the source as you possibly can. Now, you're still limited by how deep you can record because the electrodes are directly on the cortex. They're not very deep into the brain. So the signal is going to be better than EEG. You don't have all of this attenuation from the skull, the skin, and so on and so forth. But it's still not this perfect, super duper clear signal. Um, this is implanted in a lot of epilepsy patients. A lot of the patients that we study with invasive technologies are not quote unquote healthy individuals. They are there for some other reason that requires a neurosurgery already uh, because neurosurgeries are very expensive, they're very dangerous, there's always the risk of getting a brain infection. Um, so we're obviously trying to minimize these risks and not just letting anybody do it. So it's sort of up to the a lot of the times it's up to the well wishes of the participants to allow, allow us to collect this data because they definitely don't need to participate in these studies. They're there for a completely different set of medical reasons a lot of the times. Uh, but yeah, the signal from, from ECOGS is similar to EEG, but it's more at the, at the base, right? It's, you're getting much closer to the source of the signals. It's still not... Yeah, it's still not perfect if you're trying to get individual neurons, right? You're not collecting from one neuron in particular or even a small cluster of neurons. You're still recording from thousands of, of different neurons at a time, and that activity is summated on the surface of each of these electrodes. But it's a very interesting signal. I haven't worked a lot with ECOGS, but there are a lot of people who have. So I'm pretty sure Ina and Q both have worked with ECOGS before. Trini, have you worked with ECOGS data? Okay, so if you're planning on doing an ECOGS project, we might not be super well armed to help you, but we'll do our best. Um, and here's something that is in that in-between category of the semi-invasive or minimally invasive technology. These are stentrodes. So the brain, as you can imagine, needs a lot of blood because it is a very high-powered part of the human body. It requires a lot of oxygen, so it has extensive vasculature, uh, sort of 
some of the main veins slash arteries are modeled here. And what the goal of the stentrode is, is to take something that is small enough to fit within these veins or arteries and move it into a place where you're interested in recording and then expanding them. So it works just like any other stent. And as soon as it's expanded, it'll stay in that position. And as you can see here, there's a yellow arrow pointed at this little plate that is an electrode. So each of these little plates are individual electrodes and they're connected to some main computer through this, this stent's wiring itself. Um, this is a very interesting technology because it doesn't require a neurosurgery. So you can simply, I mean, I wouldn't say simply, but you can get this into the circulatory system, use, uh, I think they use CAT scanning to position it where they want to in the brain, then they expand it, and it's going to record activity relatively locally to that region. Um, and I'm glad I added this slide because yesterday I was trying to look for papers on the stentrode, and I discovered that the first human BCI had actually been created with the stentrode. So this is the assessment of, safe, of safety of a fully implanted endovascular BCI. And this was published on January 9th, 2023. So two days ago, really, really fresh off the press. Um, this is the same people who developed the stentrode originally. It's a group from Australia, and they've been working on this since, I don't know, like 2015 or something. And it's super cool. So here's, here's a diagram of where they're putting the stentrode. They're targeting the areas in the precentral pre gyrus. Gyrus just means it's a, you know, gyrus is fold, right? No, gyrus is, yeah, it's fold. It's the fold. Um, sorry, there's sulci and gyri. And I always confuse them because, like, I think of gyroscopes and, like, gyrocopters, which, like, for me is, like, altitude. But anyway, the gyrus. They, they put the centrodes right there. And what they're doing is they're trying to target the motor cortex. Same same thing that the other one was targeting. Yes, question. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question was, do these cause brain aneurysms? Uh, that is definitely a risk, right? Whenever we're putting something into the vasculature of the brain, we risk potentially increasing the likelihood of clotting. We introduce the likelihood or the chance of tearing a, a main vein or the artery of a brain. It's something that's pretty dangerous. Uh, the patients that are participating in these are patients who sort of are at that stage in their life where they think the risk outweighs the, or sorry, the pro outweighs the risk. So they're really paralyzed people. They have really low quality of lives and they understand that, yes, this might kill them, but they're willing to do it because there's sort of nothing better. Uh, it's not, definitely not a healthy population that is volunteering in these types of studies. And that's why this paper's title is assessment of the safety, right? This is sort of the first of its kind in, in human trials. Uh, and I guess as a brief summary of the paper, it seems to be quite safe. There wasn't really that many, uh, there weren't that many critical events that happened, you know, these sort of life-threatening events or anything. And the, the stent was stable. It stayed in the same position that the researchers implanted it in. But as you can imagine, there's still an increased risk for these aneurysms or a multitude of different effects. That's a good question. And I see that Zoom has a question as well. Tangential question, but if the brain has so much vasculature, where is the brain body barrier? <laughs> that is a, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. That's almost a philosophical question, I feel like. Um, that was Abhinav. Oh, yeah, do you mean the, the blood-brain barrier, Abhinav, or did you yeah, actually... Sorry, that's what I meant. Okay, okay. My, my bad. Um, so I guess the, the blood-brain barrier is... I don't know, for me, it's sort of this amorphous thing. I'm not a neuroscientist, by the way. But the blood-brain barrier is a combination of the supporting structures of the brain, allowing the transport of oxygen... <laughs> To, to the actual nervous tissue? Yeah. I see. So the, a student said that it's the cerebral spinal fluid that separates it. That is almost definitely true. But I, 
Well, there's also the Dura. Okay, so the answer is it's, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. I can post a, an announcement to that. But yes, firmly not a neuroscientist, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yes. That's a good question. So the question was, for these types of new studies, do the patients have to pay for the technologies? Typically, when it's something like this, it's fully covered by either the insurance or it's something that the researchers have funding to, to study. So, you know, these researchers would have written multi-million dollar grants for, you know, their government who would have then supplied the, the money to pay for the engineers, the development of the technology, the surgeons, all of that stuff. Um, once these devices are ready for market and they're ready to target the average patient that needs them, then that's something that they might have to pay out of pocket for, but hopefully their insurance covers that. And that's something that we see even now with the, the spinal stimulations, for example. So there are patients with chronic pain, for example, that have these electrodes just permanently in their spines and they have these little charging packs and stuff. And most of the time, the insurance covers that treatment. Um, well, that's a really good question. OK. I see. All right, Abhinav, the answer to the blood-brain barrier is it's uh, the junction of the, the capillaries themselves is, is the blood-brain barrier which is interesting. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to read more on that. Um, any other questions? And by the way, really good questions. Keep asking them whenever they come up, because part of this class is it should be interactive. I, I imagine a lot of you are facing some of this material for the first time, so it's, it's good to have these questions. Um, anyway, so the, the stent in this case was placed in the precentral gyrus, and the goal of that is to record from motor movements. In this case, because of its position, um, it's actually really close to the region and cortex that controls the lower extremities, so your, your legs, your feet, and so on. So for those of you who haven't seen this, probably non-cog size students, this is the human homunculus and the representation of the it's about the same for the motor and the somatosensory cortex, but essentially there's this pretty consistent distribution of which regions of the cortex respond to which parts of your body. So we can see that in this sulcus right here, which is exactly where they're targeting the stentrode right there, we have the toes, the foot, the leg, and the hips. So a lot of those lower extremities are close to those electrodes, which means it's a really good target candidate for your control scheme. In the case of this BCI, they wanted to use a, you know, this, imagine like a foot tap to determine if something was gonna be a, uh, a long click or a short click with the eye tracker system. And with the, the, the solo brain system, I think they were trying to capture the left or right up or downness, which is a little harder to do, but you can map that to different schemes, such as you know, like raising the foot down, you know, tapping the foot down versus thinking of raising the foot up. Um, I have to revisit this. I only was able to skim this, but I know for sure in this one they they were using foot tapping to determine if it was a short or a long click. Um, yeah, so there is preferential area dedicated to the things that we use the most. So the re the reason why they create these monstrous looking things is to sort of show you the scale that the brain uh, allocates for certain uh, certain movements and sensors. So as you can see, the hands and the mouth and tongue are overemphasized because we speak and we use our hands for everything, essentially. We're very dexterous. Um, and, you know, the feet have less less area, so you might be thinking, okay, that's maybe not the best control scheme. But again, because of where the electrodes are, it, it just makes sense. We'll talk about this more when we talk about motor imagery BCIs, especially with EEG. But a lot of the time, these regions are so big that we can't, um, we would like to be able to target individual things. Like I want to target just the, 
the little or the ring or the middle finger. But because of this sort of smoothing effect with the scalp and the skin and all of that, um, with EEG, we're only able to really see, OK, are they thinking about hand movement at all? We're not really at that level where we're reliably getting individual finger movements, although there are a lot of people who are working towards that. Um, and but yeah, just out of curiosity, how many have seen this human homunculus before? OK, okay so a good number of you. But hopefully to some students who hadn't seen it, this is interesting. OK, so I actually have a, I have a little class question here. Let me open up my tab and, and start it. Sorry. For those of you who haven't signed up for this yet, since I don't know, I think there are some people who weren't in the course yet um, last week. Uh, go on to this link and sign up. Please do use your student ID and your name so that I can give you credit. This will count towards class credit. Let me just start it up. So these aren't, uh, these are a little more on the opinion side of questions, but I am curious. So the first one here is, would you get something like this, a minimally invasive BCI implanted, if you were paralyzed? So I'm, in this question, I'm interested specifically in the event that, you know, something has happened to you and you're paralyzed. Yes? That's a good question. That would be interesting if that was my second question, huh? Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll, I'd like to see, yeah. Um, so I'll give this a, a little more time. It says it's, OK. I don't know if it actually started, but I'm getting answers. So I'm, the, again, this is totally free, so this UI is not particularly good. Um, I'll give it a little bit, though. Honestly, even 70 responses is, is quite good for the second day of class. <laughs> All right, I am going to stop it. Let's see the results. I want the poll. Where is the poll? Oh, I think I have to end the question to end current question. And then click results. Interesting. OK. So the vast majority of people are saying yes, they would get something like that. Well, either yes or maybe. And I guess for the people who are saying maybe, what are some of your reasons? What, what information would you need or what circumstances would you need to be you know, on either side, yes or no, if anybody's interested in sharing? And it can be a chat message, too, if you don't want to say it out loud. I'm just curious. Yeah? I see. That's a good answer. OK, so, so the perspective here was that uh, you would want it to be as seamless as possible, since it's an extension of yourself. And if it's not seamless, then it might cause more harm than it does good. Um, that's an interesting perspective, and I think that's something that a lot of patients also share, right? Uh, at, at this stage, they're sort of at the point where they're like, I'll take whatever I can get. Um, but if you actually talk to patients who are, become, you know, Parkinson's patients or people who are, uh, have ALS and are starting to lose control of their motor movement, what they want are systems that are more reliable, not things that are good enough, but they really want these things that are <laughs> perfect extensions of yourself. Um, Andrew says, depends on my age, but if I can ever recover from being paralyzed. I see. So the goal would be to give you some sort of additional control. Uh, so, okay, but you're interested specifically in rehabil rehabilitation. Is that, is that correct, Andrew? Or would you just want it? Would you be okay with 
still being as paralyzed, but you have like robotic legs and limbs or something like that. I'll wait for a response. But if uh, if anybody else has any, okay, actually, I'm curious. Are there any no's that feel comfortable sharing their answer? Because again, it's it's your right to to want this or not. <laughs> I'm just curious what people's perspectives are. I know there aren't many no's, so it's okay. You don't have to share. Um, but I see. Okay, but yeah, Andrew says essentially you wouldn't know un unless you're put into that situation, which I think is fair for a maybe. All right. So the next question is similar, and it is same thing, but would you get something like this in, implanted while healthy to do some sort of basic tasks? So this would be sort of like just for fun, you know? Maybe you, know, maybe you can use it to control, I don't know. One idea that I always have, I'm not saying this is possible, so don't, don't think I'm saying this is possible, but it would be interesting if you could have a BCI like this that could give you control of something that you have never had before. So like control of a tail or like wings in a simulation or something like that. Like how would you go about learning that? I don't know, but that would be awesome. Yeah. I'm going to say now. So would you get something like this now? And if you answered before and you want to change your answer, you can. So as is, you know, from this fresh off the press paper from two days ago, would you be interested in getting something like that just for fun? Imagining they would let you, which obviously they wouldn't. But <laughs> pretending that, you know, you have some sort of put things in me free card, you know, I don't know. Would you do it? I think this is about the same number of people, so I'm going to go ahead and end that. Have a bit of a shift in, uh, in the answers there, which, is, which makes sense, right? I mean, most of us recognize that there are these potential dangers, aneurysms, <laughs> uh, blood clots, slicing of arteries and stuff, and we don't necessarily want to do that unless we have to. And that is actually a trend in BCIs in general, not just these invasive ones, but a lot of the times a BCI is, is your last possible resort. If you can use any other control scheme, you should try to use that because BCIs are slow, they're somewhat unreliable, and in the case of even the minimally invasive ones, quote unquote minimally invasive ones, they can be dangerous. Um, so this is about what I was expecting. Again, I'm going to ask again, if, oh yeah, sorry, quick question. Yeah, sure, yeah. So the, the response was for basic tasks, it might be easier to have some sort of portable one that you can just take on and off and not something that's permanent. Um, I agree with that, and I don't want to necessarily put my bias on this course, but it is, I mean, I am teaching it, and it is an EEG-based focus course, but I think the non-invasive modalities are more uh, accessible for tasks that are not life-threatening or critical or whatever because of that exact reason. You don't have to commit to it. You can sort of put them on, take them off. If you don't like it, you can stop using it. If, only, if you only need it for you know, two hours a day, you don't have to have something that's always inside of you. You can just put it on, take it off. Um, so I will ask, for any, if there's any brave soul that answered yes, would you be interested in, in sharing your response? You don't have to, but just curious. <laughs> and if you don't feel like sharing in public, I'm personally curious. So you can, you can send me an email if you're interested. I'll give you an extra participation credit, just because I'm curious. Um, all right. Well, that was fun. Um, and then another minimally invasive technology, which is, it's not, this one's weird because we're not at the level of recording from this yet, but we are at the level of using this to, okay. Please behave. All right, this is not behaving. This is what we're. This is what we have to deal with. Um, so this minimally invasive technology is wireless magnothermal deep brain stimulation. This is research done by an MIT researcher, Polina Anakiva, and essentially, I think this is 
it's so crazy. But what they do is they inject magnetic nanoparticles into the bloodstream. They find their way to the brain, and they use magnetic coils in order to activate these magnetic nanoparticles, and they produce heat. Um, that heat from that nanoparticles ends up affecting these capsaicin-sensitive receptors in certain neurons, which then stimulates the neurons. So they're using magnetic nanoparticles that get hot to control neuronal activation, which is like, I mean, that's mind-boggling. That, when, I, when I first read this paper, I was like, how, what? In what world is that possible? But the crazier thing is that the same researchers are interested in changing the scheme and potentially recording from those nanoparticles. So rather than activating those nanoparticles to produce heat, you would send radio waves that can pick up the small magnetic field differences that those particles are picking up. And you, know, you can see those differences with the radio waves and potentially record from various regions of the brain without having to have you know, an fMRI, which is super expensive and requires liquid helium, and um, without having to do a surgery. Essentially, this is just injecting nanoparticles into your, into your blood system, which I think is really interesting. Again, we're not there yet, but I sort of wanted to bring it up as a potential technology that we could, we could see in the next, again, 15, 20 years, who knows. Um, this is, yeah, this is sort of just as a way of thinking about the future, being a little optimistic about these technologies, because in this class, I will be a downer sometimes, or I guess a realist about where the technology is. So it's nice to feel a little inspired that there is cooler stuff on the horizons, and it's not just like, oh, everything is so boring, and it's like, oh, it doesn't work all the time. It's like, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, it's just where we currently are right now, and I want to be very pragmatic, uh, but also hopeful. And once again, I have a lot more content than I was able to get through, and I'll end there because I don't want to take up too much of the time. Luckily, uh, I have, okay, so for next lecture, I'm planning in general for Fridays to be live coding sections, but the first assignment is super duper easy, so I probably only need like 10 minutes to show you guys how these things work. Um, so I'm just going to end up finishing the intro to neuroimaging on Friday. It, again, if the Jupyter Hub stuff isn't set up by Friday, then I'll just delay the release of the assignment. Um, but yeah, stay tuned for that. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will upload it. The reason I like to upload them afterwards is because of stuff like this where I have like a whole other lecture of content and I'd rather just give you guys what we talked about and then save that. I know someone asked if I could do it before, but yeah, this is why I like to do it after. <laughs> cool. And again, if you have any questions about, oh yeah, one more question. Sorry, say it again. Okay, okay. Uh, send me an email and I'll, yeah, I'll give you the credits for that. Yeah. And if anyone had any other issues with class question, just send me a message on Canvas or put it on Piazza and we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, and also, someone asked if the lab will be recorded on Friday. Yes, it will be. All right. I will see you guys on Friday.